My name is Ricky Spindler, and I'm the lead pastor here. And we're in this series called Honey in the Rock. We sung about it earlier. Honey is a metaphor for wisdom. God says in Deuteronomy that we will suck honey that is hidden in the rock. That means when we get in the hard places of life, suffering that we don't understand. That when we get in decisions that come out of nowhere, but they're timely and we have to decide. Or we get into situations where they're equally good. What do I do? We need some honey in the rock. We need some wisdom that we can apply. And uh, wisdom is God's perspective on situations. It's living low and thinking high. That's wisdom. Wisdom is uh, the principles of God's word. It's the scripture solutions to the situations you're facing. It's looking at life through the principles of God's word. When I marry perspective and principle, it unleashes God's power. His divine attributes are connected to his wisdom. When I honor the finances with wisdom, he blesses my finances. When I honor my relationships with biblical wisdom, guess what? He blesses my relationships. Whatever wisdom touches, God pours out his favor and blessing. But wisdom is a paradox. I pray for it. But I also have to pursue it. It's something that God gives, and it's something that I move and work towards. It's, it's also uh, the place where God hides it. It's his presence. That's why it's in prayer. He hides it in his word. That's the principles. But he also hides it in people. He hides it in people. And when you walk with the wise, somebody that's a little bit further along in God's perspective, a little bit further along in applying the principles, they've sowed the seeds and they're reaping the harvest now. And you can see them as a picture of a preferred destination. You get around them. And the wisdom is poured into you. What we're doing right now, though, is we're talking about how wisdom has a predictable path. And when I get on it, then it leads to certain places and destinations. And in a few moments, if you will, I want you to join me in Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. We're going to read that in a few moments. In a few moments. Because I believe if you were to take any verse that really speaks to all that wisdom is and can do in the entire Bible, specifically Old Testament, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 is where you want to go. That really has a lot to say about wisdom and how it works and how it guides us. Today's sermon will be, we will look at three boats, three different boats. Okay, so we're going to start with one boat, have a boat in the middle, and a boat at the end. There's going to be a lot of boats today, but hopefully it makes sense by the end. First boat, is I found myself, we were celebrating my uh, father-in-law's 70th birthday and, and the family, we got together and all pitched in, rented an Airbnb in the land between the lakes in Kentucky, Barclay, Kentucky Lake. And we decided that my father-in-law loves to fish, so we're going to go fishing for the day. And we uh, decided, uh, Shay and I, my wife and I, we were in charge of picking out the guide and I love when you put fishing guides in. There's everybody, they're looking at their fishing poles, they're showing you the boats, there's, there, there are all kinds of pictures. How do you decide? And I decided I'm gonna pick the oldest dude I can find. A little gnarly, you know what I'm saying? He, he looked like he'd been out in the sun way too long. I got a grizzle to him. I'm not looking for the fancy boat. In fact, I want a few dings on that boat. And when, I, when we looked at it, the description was, I, I've been fishing these waters for 50, 60 years. And I said, Shay, forget about the others. That's the one I want. So I called this dude. Ken, he couldn't text him. You got to call him, okay? I called this guy. He's probably 80 years old. And he's like, why did you pick me out of all of them? I said, man, you, you grew up here. Like, you're like 80 years old. I figure if you don't know where the fish are, there's no fish in the lake, okay? He says, meet me here. What do you want to fish for? I said, you're the one that lives there. You tell me. He goes, all right, meet me here, and I'll tell you what we're going to fish for. So sure enough, we meet at the gas station right before you hit the bridge. We pull in there. I'm buying bait, buying all kinds of stuff, and we get in there. We get in the truck. I got to ride with him, my father-in-law, and my, my brother-in-law. They're, they're, they're in the other car. I get in. This guy I don't even know, and he goes, we're fishing for blue catfish. I said, great. Why? Well, barometric pressure, wind, the front that's coming through, and I've already went and got the temperature of the water. Today, the blue cats are going to be biting. I said, well, that's what we're fishing for. We get on his boat. We go just a, uh, not even a few hundred yards. And he said, this is where they're going to be. 
We throw our lines out in the water. We're going to drift. And sure enough, we catch some blue catfish. Before noon, we had filled up the entire well of that boat with blue catfish. That old man had a contract with those blue cats that day. I mean, I'm telling you. There was one moment. This is no exaggeration. I, I, I can't, you can't write this stuff. This old man just sitting there. He's looking at the GPS system. He says, all right, boys, throw them in the water when I tell you to throw them in the water. <laughs> now, throw it in the water. He goes, I'm going to count to 10, and when I get to 10, they'll bite. 10, 9, and sure enough, he gets the one. Next thing you know, wham, 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 wham. I'm like, whoa, I got the best fishing guide ever here, you know? This was awesome. And as I was writing my sermon today, I thought about wisdom in that kind of place. I could have went fishing on my own. I could have spent the whole day and probably never caught a fish. But the moment I got on that guy's boat and submitted to his wisdom, he took me to the places where he knew where the fish were. Now watch this. Here's what he told us. He says, I've got over 100 places on this lake, on this GPS, where I have personally put debris in the water to create structure for the blue catfish to be. And I know where they are. And I thought to myself, you know what? That's exactly what wisdom does for you. It prepares a place for you can experience life and life to the full. That's exactly what wisdom. It'll take you places you could never find on your own, give you experiences you could never have on your own. And I'm not telling you the name of the guide, so don't ask. That's my guide, okay? Get your own, okay? He's an old man now, though. I mean, telling you. You know, when we are thinking about wisdom, we're in this time of the year where many of us, are, some of us are graduating and, and I'm, I have that in my mind and we're thinking about where am I going to go to grad school? I'm get, where do I get a job? In some cases, you know, am I going to marry this person or not? A lot of decisions that have to be made in a small part of time. But life is filled with decisions and, and Proverbs 3 gives us the path of wisdom in regards to decisions. So we're going to put it on the screen. And I'd, I'd love for us, if we could, to read this together out loud, if we could. All right? I'm going to count to three, and then we'll start. Ready? One, two, three. Here we go. Trust in the Lord. We got to work on that submit part. Seems like we got a little confused on the submit part there for a little bit. In all your ways, submit to him. I like that and he will make your path straight. We talked last week about uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust is to put your full weight upon something so that it can sustain you and carry you. You Trust in the most trustworthy entity being, and that's God. And we do that with all of our heart. That's our mind, our will, and our emotions. They all come into play, our thoughts, our desires, and our motives when it comes to determining the will of God. In this sentence, though, there's a conjunction. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In there is an admonition and in there is a warning and they're parallel. We don't get to do either or. We have to do both of them. We can trust in the Lord with all of our heart, but sometimes the hardest thing is to learn the discipline of not leaning on our own understanding. Uh, The word lean not there in the Hebrew is is borrowing from the word trust to put your full weight upon something. Lean not means the picture behind it is leaning on a crutch. Something that's holding you up, giving you some stability. But when it, and it's lean not, it means that it's been compromised. It's been fractured. And that the more you put your weight on it, the more the fracture, it's going to fracture. And ultimately, it's going to be destroyed and what you're leaning on is going to fall to the ground. Lean not on your own understanding. Some translations say, do not be wise in your own eyes. Uh, Some translations say, uh, don't trust in yourself. Uh, One translation, I like this one, says, do not trust your own opinion. And what I want to look at is that word own. I want to put an umbrella on that and call it ownership attitudes. These are attitudes that are within you and within me to varying degrees at different times. They they are the tendency 
to lean on our own, our own opinions. In fact, every one of these people you will meet in the book of Proverbs. The, the Proverbs give four individuals, more, but primarily four. Uh, there's the one we all want to be, that's the wise one. But then there's three others that are warnings in the scripture that we all know and we've all been at times. And I'm going to give them to you, then I'm going to unpack them. You have the naive person, you have the fool, and then you have the scoffer. And each one of them have a different relationship with opinion and ownership attitude. The first one is the naive. And the naive will define them as they are committed to their own reality. They often are marked by a lack of, um, a lack of preparation. They don't know what they need to have and there's almost sometimes a will for ignorance and, and they often make decisions based on assumption because of the experience that they lack. In fact, the only way you move the foolishness out of the naive is you have to give them experience. Experience is their best teacher. The, the thing, the naive person, the scripture says this in Proverbs, uh, it says this in Proverbs 7, and among the naive, the inexperienced and gullible, I saw among the youth a young man lacking good sense. And that's how you would describe the naive. Often they just lack some good common sense. You ever met some people? Hold up, wait a minute, something ain't right here. <laughs> they just lack. Now wisdom is more than common sense, but it often includes common sense. They just seem to lack good sense. Here's the thing. Here's how opinion relates to them or if it's them. Because they're so naive, they're open to any and all opinions. They have a wide open heart. And they're heavily influenced by outside opinion. That's the naive. The second one is the fool. And the fool is this. They have their, they demand their own way. They're all about their own way. And listen to these verses in Proverbs when it comes to the fool. Proverbs 1, 7. The fool shows up seven verses in the Proverbs. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. The favorite phrase of a fool is, I already know. Well, I already know that. Uh, you don't need to talk. I already know. The second phrase of a fool is this. You want to know what I think? <laughs> Proverbs 18.2. Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. Uh, fools ask very few questions, but they have a whole lot of statements. A whole lot of opinions. That's what the fool loves about opinions. They have many of them, and they want you to know what their opinions are. Not concerned about yours, but theirs. Oh, but then every one of these have varying degrees, different levels of pride. The last one is called the scoffer. And these are people who have become their own gods. In fact, some translation, I think it's the Passion's translation, they call them the evil ones. The, some translations call them the wicked one because they have become, in essence, their own God. Now listen, uh, they're not open to any opinion. Uh, they don't even really care to talk about their own opinion. You know what the scoffer does? They love their opinion and they hate yours. Listen to what the scripture says about the scoffer. Proverbs 21, 24. Listen to this description. Scoffer is the name of the arrogant haughty man who acts with arrogant pride. Second Peter 3, 3, listen to this. This is how you know you're in the end times. Most importantly, Peter says, I want to remind you that in the last days, scoffers will come mocking the truth and following their own desires. What marks the scoffer is their hatred for wisdom. Mockery is what the scripture uses. Three individuals Solomon describes in the book of Proverbs, different orientations toward opinion, but all moving and despising to varying degrees wisdom. And what I want to do is I want to show you how every one of these are in play in a modern parable, the second ship. And today is an anniversary of sorts. Tonight 
at 11.40 p.m. till tomorrow at 3 a.m. in the morning is the anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic. This morning, I, I, I went to Ireland in Belfast. I think we got a picture of this. Did we, did we get a picture of this this morning? I think we sent it in. Maybe we did, maybe we didn't. It's me and my coffee. Come on, I had the Titanic blend coffee. There you go, right there from Belfast, Ireland. I couldn't go see the Titanic because of the weather, but at least I got to drink some coffee with the Titanic blend, all right? So I was thinking about this today, and I want to just, on the anniversary of this, I want to tell you that what sunk the Titanic was foolishness. I'm going to show you that in that story, you had the naive, the fool, and the scoffer all on one ship. April the 7th, 1912, the Titanic set sail on its maiden voyage. It was one of two ships, the White Star Fleet. It was their, their star ship right here. It was about seven and a half million dollars in 1912 to make, which in today's, you know, when you talk about inflation, it would take that ship to build it today would be about half a billion dollars, 500 million. It was roughly about 880 feet long, two and a half football fields standing up and down. That ship would have been 72 stories tall and the largest building in the world if it was a building at that time standing up and down. This was massive. It was named the Titanic after the Titan Greek gods. Uh, a first class ticket on the Titanic was about $1,700. Would have been in today's currency about 50 G, $50,000. That's a lot of money. It had 40 tons of potatoes on it, 40,000 eggs, 3,000 pounds of coffee, 1,000 pounds of grapes. 2,200 passengers were on that boat. When it, it started out a few days into the journey, or towards the end, off the coast of Newfoundland, it hits an iceberg. And it hits it at 1140. And by 3 a.m., it is broken into two halves, has sunk four miles to the bottom of the ocean at that part, and only 700 out of the 2,200 would survive. They say that when they left port, um, that they had made the decision to not to carry so many lifeboats because they were so certain that they didn't need them. In fact, they did not even go through the drills that we now go through if you've been on a cruise on what happens if we need to get on the lifeboat. So they didn't have enough lifeboats and they didn't even go through the drills on what to do in, in the in inevitability that you would need one. Everything that they learned about the lifeboats, they learned while the ship was sinking. E.J. Smith was the captain. We got a picture, I think, of E.J. Smith. He was considered the greatest captain, one of the greatest of his day. He was going to retire after this voyage. He was at the end of his career. He was the greatest captain and got to choose the greatest crew. Spare no expenses. I mean, so you have the greatest boat, greatest captain, greatest crew. E.J. Smith said that you could cut the Titanic in half into two equal parts and both parts would float as long as you needed them to float. One journalist, actually several journalists were on record saying this, these words, that even God himself could not sink this ship. Well, <laughs> when a few hours before the Titanic hit the iceberg, there was a ship called the California, the USS California that was off the coast was off, uh, was in this general area. In fact, could see the Titanic's lights as it passed by in the distance. So they communicated, telegraphed back to another, one to another. They were able to receive uh, correspondence. And six times, the California warned the Titanic and said, stop, slow down, deadly icebergs ahead. They corresponded back and forth. The last correspondence from the Titanic to the California was this. Shut up. 
leave us alone. Last words, full steam ahead. From the time they, when they spotted, they spotted the iceberg that was in front of them. When they saw it, they had 500 yards to respond. At the speed at which they were traveling, they surmised this, that they had a response time of about 37 seconds. They saw the iceberg. The massive ship is moving. The 72-story building is mo moving. And they had, because of a delayed decision, 37 seconds now to respond. When the Titanic hits the iceberg, a hole the size of a refrigerator is put into its side. No reason to panic because there's 14 Loctite holes that made up the ship. The ship, 14 sections there. And the theory was that if water comes into one section, all the others are closed off. You can't sink the ship. In theory, that was true. But here's what they found out. Is that in the construction of the ship, there were three million rivets or bolts. And they decided to save money and to make the bolts out of a lesser quality metal that was untested and became brittle in cold water. And so when the cold water comes into the middle of the ship and those bolts get cold and weight is added, they snapped. And the unsinkable ship was sunk because of three million little bolts that began to just snap in half. All of that could have been avoided if a little bit of wisdom had been applied. Where did the naive come in? The lack of preparation. To wrongly assume in the future, ah, we're not gonna run into any trouble. It was naive to think that where you were sailing, you shouldn't be prepared for a worst case scenario. Enough lifeboats, life saved. Naivety got them. Second thing, foolishness showed up. Their arrogance. Stop. Don't go any further. Deadly icebergs head. Shut up. Leave us alone. Full steam ahead. The fool demands his own way. There is a way that seems right to the fool, but the end of that way is death and destruction. Barreling through, warning after warning after warning. And where did the scoffer come up? The arrogance of the captain and the journalist. Even God himself couldn't sink this place. It was foolishness that sunk the Titanic. With that in mind, we've talked about the, the levels of foolishness. We've talked about two ships. And I just have a thought. I'm going to give you three thoughts on wisdom so you can check yourself before you wreck yourself. Ooh, come on, Pastor Ricky. Mm. 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 I've been waiting all day to say that. I've been practicing that. Mm, we're going to h and a whole nother level right now. Mm. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. Now, I have about eight to ten minutes left right here. And I got to warn you, you're not going to like what comes next. Okay? Because we're heading towards the third ship. And it, I, I, I moved forward with gentleness and humility. Let me say that. First thing that I think we have to check ourselves before it leads to destruction is this. You have to understand that the starting point of wisdom is always humility. Wisdom starts with, now I've, I've played with the word own and I've rewrote it. Instead of own, I got parentheses, the first, the, the, we're gonna do one, some hard one, W-O-N, wisdom here. And that's it, wisdom starts with humility. In the book of Proverbs, it says it this way. It says, in the message paraphrase, Proverbs 1, right before it speaks to the fool, it says, start with God. The first step in learning is to bow down to God, is bowing down to God. That's what it says in the message paraphrase. In the NIV, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You know, when we're born... Out of all of God's creation, humankind is born the most foolish. 
because most of God's creation in the animal kingdom has sometimes minutes, hours, and days to start walking and learning by instinct or it will be destroyed and become the food of prey. Most of the animals in the world learn by instinct. It is encoded in their DNA and they will learn to walk immediately within hours because their very life depends on it. I've, I've, I've read the story of giraffes just literally minutes after they're born. They will begin, the mother will begin to kick the baby giraffe with its foot. Literally topple it over and over because the mother knows it has minutes, if not hours, before it comes the food of lions. The instinct has to kick in. But humanity, you and I, we don't learn primarily by instinct. We learn by instruction. We learn language by instruction. We learn to walk by watching others walk. We, we learn social cues by watching other social cues. We learn by instruction. And what, when, when I say wisdom starts with humility, that means this, is that I cannot be the, my own source of wisdom. That wisdom is something that starts and originates on the outside. That's something that I put on the inside of me. What humility says is that it starts with the fear of God, and I realize, God, you're God and I'm not. You know where the fish are. I don't know where they are. Come on. And I need the wisdom and perspective and principles that you have. I'm going to take those, your instruction, and put it in my heart. Proverbs 15 says this, that the fear of the Lord is instruction, but humility comes before honor. And as I see the Lord, he reveals himself to me. Then what happens is I respond to that and his instruction, watch this, begins to change my thoughts, my desires, and my motives. That's the heart, my mind, will, and emotions. And as they instruct me, the word and the Holy Spirit, as they instruct my heart, guess what? I have a saying that says this, when the heart becomes right, then the paths become straight. So, but the problem is, if I begin to see my own source, myself, that wisdom starts on the inside of me, then what happens is this. Over time, I will say that my opinion and God's wisdom are of equal value. Because I'm now the source of wisdom, not God. Let that play out over time and you begin to value your own opinion over God's wisdom. If you're a Christ follower and we never read the word sparingly and we never pray sparingly, we are increasingly trusting our opinion and we are slowly losing the ability to gain wisdom. The more I value my opinion, the more I lose the ability to be wise. I was on a fishing trip one time and uh, some guys from Stone Creek and I had to stay up late. We fished all day. I had to stay up late. I wasn't planning on saying this, but I think this is for somebody today. And the man I was rooming with from Stone Creek, this is years ago, waited for me until about mid. He was a talker. So I was like, man, I'm trying to out. I want him to be asleep when I walk in. I don't want to have to do the pastoral thing. I just want to go to bed. But the man was waiting on me in a chair. And when I walked in, he said, sit down. I got something to tell you. He says, the Lord has spoken to me and I am going to leave my wife and I'm going to enter into a relationship with another woman. Now, in those moments, I'll tell you what pastors should do. That's what I did. I start in my mind and literally breath prayer. I'm like, oh, God, help me. (laughs) Tell me what to say. And immediately I thought of this. I said, okay, let's just assume that it is God's will. I'm going to ask you two questions. Number one, do you pray? Not really, hardly ever. Number two, do you read the word? Not really, hardly ever. So you never read the word and you never pray and you heard the voice of God. 
I said, you didn't hear God's voice. And then I told him what, the, what, what God really was telling him. Break up with the girlfriend, go back to your wife, and make things right. Yeah. Now watch this. I wish you could say he listened, but he didn't. And I can tell you great destruction followed that man in the next few months. But there's always somebody warning you. Just think about that. In Ezekiel, the judgment of the Lord was this. I will speak to them according to the idols of their heart. Can I just tell you that the worst thing you can do is trust your thoughts and to trust your desires and to trust your motives? I don't even trust mine. And you shouldn't trust yours. Lean not on your own opinion. Now, here's the second thing I want to tell you, and that's this, is that wisdom is not an opinion. Wisdom is not the same thing as opinion. We live in an increasingly digital dependent world that is connective with all kinds of platforms on social media. And there's a lot of good that comes to that, a lot of connectivity to that. But can I just tell you that one of the dangers of social media is the rise of the fool. Because what it does, those algorithms will create echo chambers for your opinion and get enough people that agree with you and your opinion can turn into truth. You can have a million followers on Facebook and still end up in hell. Come on. I told you you weren't going to like me. Because here's the thing. We are living in an, an age where we say, that's your truth, but this is my truth. You can mask opinion with the word truth, but it's just what you're saying in that statement. That's your opinion. That's my opinion. Because listen, you don't get to possess truth. Truth cannot be possessed by any person. When you say it's my truth, you're leading out of your own heart. You're saying it started within me. And we've already talked about the problem with that. But watch this. You don't possess truth, but truth can possess you. And that's the difference. The greatest wisdom verse in the Bible is John chapter 14. This is the greatest wisdom verse in the New Testament. This is because Jesus is the personification of wisdom. Listen to what he says. I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. So that means this. If my opinion and my truth dis, uh, are indirect, they are, they are in contradiction to who Jesus was to the teachings of Jesus and to the word that Jesus embodied, if my opinion, no matter how many likes I have and how many whole groups of people corroborate that, then here's what the scriptures would say. You're wrong. And the scriptures in Jesus is right. That's what it teaches. Because listen, opinion is about accommodation and wisdom is about transformation. When a fool hears truth, they change truth to fit their reality. But when a wise person hears truth, they change their reality towards the truth. That's the difference between the wise and the fool. I read a story about the, uh, some Scandinavian countries when it comes to uh, people walking on the streets. They they realized that when people walked the streets, they were looking down at their cell phones and people were walking and falling off curves and breaking their ankles and were walking out into traffic and getting hit by cars. They were walking into trees and trash cans and light posts. I mean, people were just, they were so, what they decided to do was they said, you know what? There's a lot of people doing this. We're going to put stoplights embedded into the concrete sidewalk. So when they're walking, they can look down and see a red light, yellow light, and a green light. And hopefully they'll know, oh, wait a minute, I can't walk. They've even gone so far as to put padding around light posts and around trees and around trash cans because if they happen to accidentally bump into them, they don't want to cause them harm. 
And I thought to myself, what in the world? Because see, when, when we lean into opinions, we would rather accommodate it, the behavior, than challenge the behavior. Let's put padding all around it rather than to speak hard truth and to the opinion. I could go a whole lot more on that, but I won't. I just want to say simply this, is that wisdom is not an opinion. It is transcendent, it is timeless, and it ultimately is embodied in the life, ethic, philosophy, and person of Jesus. Lastly is this, and this is where you're really not going to like me, but is this, wisdom doesn't always make sense. Wisdom will not always make sense. I love it when it runs parallel to common sense, but sometimes it takes a hard right. Um, this is the third ship. In Genesis 6, God looks down and says, I don't like the heart of mankind. It's wicked. The imagination and thoughts of the hearts are bad. I'm going to have to destroy the earth, but I'm going to pick one person that I'm going to rebuild afterwards with. And the scripture says that that man was the man by the name of Noah. Now, up to this point, the scripture says that it's never rained on the earth. God somehow in the scriptures, it says he watered it with a mist. But he says, I'm going to destroy the earth. I'm going to cover it. There's going to be no land. I'm going to cause water to gush from the earth, and I'm going to cause rain from the sky. Never rained. So Noah built a boat. Never been built before. Never needed one. Never rained. But God gives him the instruction to build a boat, and for decades, he built something never been built before for a judgment that was coming in the future didn't make sense to everybody around him. In fact, they criticized him, mocked him, did all kinds of things. That's what the scoffer will do because he's built something for something that's not even happened before. In fact, when God tells him to build it, there's no rudder. But the scripture says this in Genesis 6. It says that when he builds it, Noah did everything just as God commanded him in verse 22. You know the ultimate landing point of wisdom? You know what it is? Is obedience. Wisdom is ultimately about obedience. And sometimes the will of God and what God's telling you to do, what the scriptures are going to tell you to do, don't make sense to you. They won't make sense to culture. They won't make sense to the people that your classmates with, your roommates with. They don't make sense to you when you say, I'm going to save myself and walk in a different kind of purity. Uh, I'm going to do some stewardship things differently with my finances. Uh, I'm going to do things differently with my time. In, just like in Noah's day, the scripture says in the last days, it will be like the days of Noah. When you're going to live according to wisdom, there's a couple of things that's going to happen. Number one, you're going to be incredibly lonely. You're going to be lonely. You're going to be ostracized. You're going to be left out. You're going to be judged harshly. That's, that's going to happen as the days get more and more wicked. Uh, another thing is, um, that's why the scripture says, let us not forsake the gathering together of God's people. This is going to grow in more and more importance. Our neighborhood gatherings are going to grow in more and more. Our prayer meetings are more and more important. And so wisdom is lonely, but also wisdom will draw its own criticism. People hate your opinion, hate your lifestyle, hate the wisdom that you have. And let me just say this. The Titanic was built by professionals and it sunk. But the ark was built by an amateur and it floated for a year on the earth and never sunk. Come on, somebody. That's it. That's wisdom. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come and get ready. But I want you to look at me here because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach you something that I learned in high school on a lunch break from an old man. I got, I got to, to, to go. We had a guest speaker in my home church and it was all about the will of God. I'm a probably 16, 17 year old kid. I've only been saved a couple of years, but man, did that. I just, it's, you never know when God's going to give you a piece of wisdom that's going to just be the rudder that guides you a lifetime. 
Here's the thought, you ready? There are three levels to God's will. The first is his pervasive will. That is what he's been doing since Genesis to Revelation. God has a plan, he has a theme, he's working throughout the history of mankind. We're born in the season and the time and the place we're to be born. We will serve the purposes of our generation, then we will die. We're in the plan and the scope of God. That's his pervasive will. At the end, at the most personal level, you have his permissive will or his personal will to you. That's where you, you discern um, uh, who do I marry? Where do I go to college? What grad school do I go to? You got all these decisions in the permissive, of the per personal will of God where you decide things that aren't in the word. In the middle of those two, pervasive, as big as it gets, personal, as small as it gets, you've got the moral will of God. Where God in the scriptures outlines his moral wisdom for you, Ten Commandments, and the different boundaries that he places around things. Now, here's what I just want to, I'm going to be a pastor. This, for some reason, this was heavy on my heart this week, is we can't go from pervasive to personal and ignore moral will. And when we get outside of God's moral wills and moral boundaries, we, we increasingly lose the ability to discern his personal will. When this gets confusing and cloudy on a personal level, retreat back to God's moral will and examine your mind, will, and emotions. And am I increasingly or small, in small ways or in big ways stepped outside of God's moral will? Okay. What do you mean by that? Is I cannot expect God to lead me in a personal way if I'm shacking up and living with my, my boyfriend or my girlfriend. I told you you weren't going to like me. I'm just being a pastor. I don't know why this is so heavy when I'm in prayer this week. We can't say, I, I want you to lead me, God, and I need to know what do I do, and I just have a hard time understanding. What I, listen, I don't, it's not the parts I don't understand in Scripture. It's the parts I do understand. And if we're in direct violation of God's parameters in Scripture, that's where you need to start. And it may not make sense to you. You may not even like it. You may not even want to do it. But that's exactly what wisdom demands. Lean not on your own understanding. Start with dealing with the pornography. Start dealing with the sexual promiscuity. Start, start dealing with the, the abuse of alcohol. Start dealing with the things that are destroying you and are outside. This, they're clear violations of the boundary. The integrity issues of taking money and secret things. That, listen, don't worry about permissive personal. Go right to the moral will and deal with it. And watch how clarity comes on that part. Watch what happens on that end for you. Now, I'm going to say this and then I'm done. One last sentence, and that's this. If you're in a season, maybe it's been years and decades, and you say, I'm blessed, Pastor Ricky. I, listen, I, I've been doing this for a long time, and I've never had any consequences. Listen, don't mistake God's kindness for his blessing and his favor. They're two different things. Now, watch this. I... And I'm not here to condemn anybody. I have been there myself. Okay? I'm just, I'm, I'm just I'm speaking hard truth. Because the scripture says it's his kindness that leads us to repentance, not his blessing and favor. And if you haven't experienced the consequences yet, then man, that's God's kindness on you. Get right. Follow the moral wisdom of God and watch what happens to your life. Amen? Come on. Let's all stand as we close. Let's put our hands out in front of us as a sign of our humility before the Lord. And just bow our head, close our eyes. And I'm always speaking to two groups. I'm speaking to the first group in this room today. If you're here and you've never submitted your heart, your mind, will, and emotions 
to the wisdom that is Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life, and you know that today. You've got off the path or you've never been on the path of Jesus, and today you want to do that. Say, Jesus, I submit to your wisdom. I surrender to you. I'm going to get right with you. I want you to be my Lord and Savior and cleanse me of my sin. And as you're praying, I'm going to speak to the other part of this room and those who are already in Christ. I just want you, if you don't mind, we do this every week, so don't, this, just take a few moments and just welcome the presence of God into your heart. Would you do that? You've sung today. You've heard the word today. You've amended it today. You've clapped for it today. Now pray it. Jesus, I draw near to you. I surrender to you, Lord. I welcome you into my heart again. I draw near to you today. Come on. It's, it's prayer often is vocal, so take your head in your heart and put it in your mouth. Now talk to the Lord in a normal tone. And let's just spend a moment here in maybe 20 seconds. Let's just thank the Lord. Could we do that? Where would you see his goodness since the last time we've gathered? We're the people of God. Thank him. Where did you see it this week? He kept you from an accident. He gave you a good report. You got some sleep you hadn't had in a while. Man, come on. Where would you see his goodness? Your kids are healthy. You're getting ready to graduate. Thank him for the goodness of God. Your mom came from mom weekend for crying out loud. Thank the Lord. That's it. And now once again, like we do every week in this series, pray for the spirit of wisdom. Lord, give me your wisdom. Give me your perspective. Give me your principles. I turn my heart to the wisdom of God. Let me walk in the fear of the Lord. Begin to instruct my heart, Lord. God, would you begin to remove foolishness from me and fill my heart with the spirit of wisdom. And just ask the Lord here, if there's anything in you that's, you know, if there's anything where you know you're outside the boundaries of the Lord, come on, just say, Lord, I repent right now and I get, I get inside today. I turn toward the wisdom of God and moral issues. I submit to them. And now I do this often. I just pray up my hand over my heart, but, and I just say, Lord, would you give me a heart of obedience? Come on, would you do that? As we close in prayer, Lord, give me a heart of obedience. One that wants to obey you, desires to obey you. Not my thoughts, not my opinion, but your wisdom that I obey, Lord. Give me an obedient heart. And now as we close, let's just lift our hands all the way up to the Lord one more time. And for 10, 15 seconds in your own words before Bruno and the team sings, can we just worship the Lord just a little bit? Come on, church. Let's just lift our hands and voices to the Lord. And just begin to say, I just, I worship you, Lord. I worship you, Jesus. You're the God of all wisdom. I magnify you in this place today. If all you do is speak and say the name of Jesus, do that right now. I just lift your name up, Jesus. And we're getting ready to sing it, but I, we're going to sing I trust in you. Just tell the Lord, I trust you. I trust in you. I trust you this day. I declare it this day to you. And please remain standing as we worship the Lord together.